Welcome everyone to our Shine a Light Lung Cancer Awareness Workshop uh, brought in partnership with the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're so pleased to have Dr. Nicholas Rose from Mount Sinai and Dr. Raymond Teets from the Institute for Family Health both joining us today. Um, and we have a really great uh, workshop plan that we hope will be really informative. Um, they're going to begin with a, doctor, with a presentation from Dr. Rose on disparities in genetic testing and targeted therapies. And following that, we will have Dr. Teets speak on incorporating complementary and integrative health into your treatment. Um, and I'll close out the session with some techniques for mindfulness and relaxation. Um, there will be some time at the end for a Q&A if you have any questions. So please feel free to post them in the chat or you can take yourself off mute at the end when we open it up to questions to ask the speakers directly. Um, in the meantime, though, if you don't mind keeping yourself mute, muted just to avoid any background noise, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so I'd like to get started by introducing Dr. Nicholas Rose. Uh, Dr. Rose is a board certified medical oncologist who specializes in treatment of lung cancer and other thoracic malignancies. He is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology at Mount Sinai Hospital. He graduated with honors from New York Medical College, where he was the chapter president of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. He then went on to complete both his medical residency and clinical fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He is affiliated with multiple hospitals, including Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai Beth Israel, Mount Sinai West, Morningside, and Brooklyn. Uh, Dr. Rose enjoys a busy clinical practice as well as actively participating in medical education and community outreach. Uh, he is co-chair of two thoracic tumor boards, a cancer liaison for the Committee on Cancer, a member of his institution's data safety and monitoring committee, and participa participates in multiple different clinical trials. His research interests include targeted therapies, immunotherapy, liquid biopsies, and lung cancer screenings. And despite being that busy, he is here with us today, which we very much appreciate. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rose. Well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And uh, as, as you sort of said, uh, I, I, I love to... I love to hate lung cancer and lung cancer awareness month is a, a very important month for me to get the word out to talk about lung cancer um, and to you know help patients loved ones understand better how we can all, all together approach this disease um, so as jean said I, I some of my interests are targeted therapies and liquid biopsies um, and we're going to be touching on some of that today. And I'm fortunate enough, as, as she said, to have a busy clinical practice and I have a very diverse clinical practice, which um, I love having. And I think uh, disparities in cancer care are also a passion of mine and minimizing those disparities. Um, so, all right, here's the talk coming up. Um, <clears throat> so I changed the title a little bit. Um, so we're going to be talking about disparities in genetic testing and targeted targeted therapy, but it didn't feel fair to have a problem without a potential solution. So hopefully we'll talk about a liquid solution. Um, next slide. So this is me. Feel free to reach out. I primarily work in Chelsea right now. I may be returning to Mount Sinai uh, West soon, um, but as was said, I, I cover many of the hospitals in the system and I'm always available to help as, as possible. I'm also on Twitter, so feel free to follow me on Twitter. I've been a little bit quiet, but I'm trying to amp it up. Next slide. So just really basically, I think if you're going to talk about a disease, you have to understand a disease. So we're going to be focusing on non-small cell lung cancer, um, which is by far the most common type of lung cancer. It's 85% of all lung cancer and it's often diagnosed around the age of 70, though I see many 60-year-olds, many 80-year-olds, even some 90-year-olds. Rarely and sadly do I see some, some very young patients in their 30s, 40s. Um, and it has a slight male predominance, a slight African-American predominance, potentially due to some of these disparities, socioeconomic barriers, smoking uh, ish, uh, uh, frequencies. Um, but really, again, I see a very broad swath of the patient population. Next slide. So how, does, how do we find lung cancer? How does it come to us? Um, you know, unfortunately, it's a very, very set of symptoms. Um, of course, we have common things like cough, a lot of uh, phlegm production, shortness of breath, people are tired, 
But if anybody has gone to their primary care clinic without some form of these uh, complaints, I'd be surprised. These are very common uh, symptoms. So it's a challenging disease to pick up early, um, even though there are probably some, some modest symptoms. Sometimes we see more obvious symptoms, chest pain, coughing up blood. Um, people notice fluid uh, around their lungs. And, uh, but these are less common and uh, often present when a, a disease is more advanced. Next slide. So uh, again, I, I'm cheating a little bit. I know this wasn't completely in the scope of my talk, but I can't help but talk about lung cancer screening. It is a passion of mine. Um, and just quickly, this is the NLST trial. So I'm going to try not to be too scientific, um, but basically this is, if I, be, if I gave a patient a chest x-ray or a low dose CAT scan, how would this help me diagnose lung cancer? And what we found, this was a study over a decade ago that was published that if we did low dose CAT scans, we reduced lung cancer related mortality by 20%. Um, but 10 years ago in lung cancer time is ancient history. So next slide. Um, this was a more uh, recent study called the Nelson study. This was in Northern European populations, but I think mimics American populations very well. Sorry, this slide's a little bit wonky. It's skewed off a little bit. But what they did was they looked at low dose CT screens, but using volumetric studies. What this means is that we're not just looking at how big a tumor gets it, or a nodule gets as far as one dimension, it's the whole volume of this nodule and how it grows. And that's really helped us uh, understand are these you know, concerning cancer nodules or just benign nodules, meaning non-cancerous. And they looked at uh, patients year one, two, four, six and a half, and 10. And this was a big study. There were about 8,000 people on the non-screening and the screening arm. And next uh, uh, slide. What we found is these are very comparable patient populations. You can see the bar graphs on the left side showing that the patients who are screened and those who are not screened are very similar in their backgrounds. And on the right side, you see the screening arm in the red and the, the control arm in the blue. So the screening arm is the ones who got the low dose CAT scans and their all cause mortality rate was much lower. So the fact that that red line is below the blue line is a good thing. That means that those patients were less likely to die, but it's all cause mortality. So not just lung cancer mortality, patients were overall helped out with this. So next slide. And this is one of my favorite slides I've ever seen in the world of lung cancer. On the right side, we see more advanced lung cancer diagnoses. Uh, and again, this is the cancer registry in, in the Netherlands on the, in the red bar. So these are sort of the, the, the historical controls uh, for cancer screening or cancer presentation. The, the green is the control arm that did not get screening. And you can see the red and the green are very similar. They have very similar distribution of early versus late stage disease. But when you look at the screening arm, all that blue suddenly shifted over to the left. That means that these patients were diagnosed at a much earlier stage of disease, 1A primarily, which is the earliest stage we can get in the most curable type of lung cancer. Um, and that makes such a big difference in patients' outcomes. So uh, a lung cancer screening is super critical. Next slide. And this panned out in the results. Um, we can see that males had a reduced lung cancer mortality by 26%, and women up to 61%. They, they by and large, had a, a much more proportional benefit from lung cancer screening. But the bottom line is lung cancer screening is, is critical in all patient populations, um, and we are slowly expanding lung cancer screening <clears throat> guidelines. Um, and one of the concerns we have about if we're checking people's lungs and we find something, is that going to mean they're going to get a bunch of extra tests? Are they going to have biopsies? Um, and other uh, invasive procedures that are, you know, kind of scary and, and have complications with them. But really only about 2.3% of the patients in this very large study ended up going to some sort of a biopsy or intervention. Um, so I think it, what it tells us is that we're able to decide which patients need to have something done and which ones don't. Um, and this study was a couple of years ago in 2018, and we're getting even better than we were then. We're, we're having really fancy additions to how we're, uh, sort of interpreting lung cancer screening tests, other CAT scans that are getting checked for other reasons, what we call incidentalomas, these tumors that we find uh, doing another workup. Um, so I'm really excited about where this space is going. Next slide. Um, and then one more, I, I can't help myself. This was a, an Italian trial that came out uh, about a year later. And again, a large study over at the 4,000 pa patients versus a low, of a low dose CAT scan versus no scan. And again, 20% overall mortality reduction. Patients were helped just broadly in their health as well as 39% reduced lung cancer mortality. 
Next slide. But you know, what do we do once we find a lung cancer? And even if we do pick up lung cancer screening, this is still a challenging disease. Um, and we're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can get better at treating it. So we've always known that tumor cells are very challenging. They do things like continue to resist cell death. They produce their own blood cells. They can continue to reproduce uh, ad infinitum. Um, and they like to grow and spread. But now we're also understanding that tumors can affect how our cellular energy is, effect, uh, is utilized and they can make energy when they're not supposed to be able to make energy. They have a lot of genetic instability and mutations that we're going to be talking about in a minute. They cause tumor promoting inflammation, meaning that they can really irritate areas near them and they avoid immune destruction, meaning they can hide from our immune system. So this has helped us really evolve the next generation of, of cancer therapies, particularly um, immune therapies and genetic therapies. Next slide. But the first thing is, I always tell my patients, I need to know what I'm dealing with. I need to name your tumor. I need to understand what it is because lung cancer is one word for many different types of diseases. The most common type on the upper right hand corner you can see is adenocarcinoma and then squamous cell carcinoma right behind that. But there's also large cell tumors, small cell lung cancers, and a bunch of other different types. So small cell, we're not really focusing on today. That's about 15% of all lung cancer, but the other 85% sort of falls into this non-small cell lung cancer uh, group, and, and we can further subdivide that. Next slide. So I get my biopsy. I decide, is this small cell? Is this non-small cell? Or my pathologist help me decide? But we don't just stop there. We're really subdividing uh, lung cancer into different types. So we go from non-small cell lung cancer into adeno, squame, other subtypes. But then we actually further subdivide squamous cell cancers into different genetic uh, classifications. Unfortunately, we haven't found a ton of uh, ways to translate that to new therapies. But in adenocarcinoma, we have a lot of really exciting uh, different mutations. You can see this whole spectrum of the rainbow there uh, in the adenocarcinoma. So next slide. And this is just a better breakdown of it. And you can see here that early stage and later stage diseases have slightly different characteristics as far as their genetic changes. But the bottom line is most of these tumors have some form of a genetic change in them that I can then translate to a therapy. ALK, ROS, RET, MET, ERBB2, uh, you know, uh, EGFR, and even now KRAS that we thought was, was really a very challenging thing to target and accounts for almost a third of these types of lung cancers, now has novel therapies that we're able to, to put in this space and help patients. So really understanding what these mutations are um, is really important. And, and I put a little marker down there. These, these mutations are, are typically mutually exclusive, meaning if I have one, I don't have the others. Um, so if I find one, I can stop my search. I can say, hey, I found a genetic driver in this tumor. What do I do with it? Um, but if I don't have this information, I don't fully understand your cancer and I won't fully know how best to care for it. Next slide. And this is why it's so important. There is a targeted revolution going on. I know that this is a very busy slide with a lot of very crazy looking names that you guys probably don't know most of, but what this is, I wanted to put this up is just to show you that this is the list of different medications that I have in my toolbox to treat different types of, of adenocarcinomas that have these mutations, um, or occasionally other non-adenocarcinoma tumors have these. Um, and if we had had this talk five years ago, 10 years ago, virtually none of these medications would have been in my toolbox. A couple of them would have been, but these are the ones that weren't quite as effective or had many more side effects. Um, and on the right side, we have some novel uh, therapies that are, are coming along. And honestly, most of these are prime time at this point. Um, this, is, this was updated back in June. And even by then, I think there's actually been some movement in this space. Um, and uh, bottom line is this is such a quickly evolving space. And I have so many new uh, treatments that are at my, at my fingertips for my patients. So it's really, really exciting. But if I don't have the right information, I won't be able to treat these patients the right way. Next slide. And that's where the disparities come in, guys. This is, this is where I really feel like we need to do better. So this was recent data published from something called the My Lung Consortium. This is a big lung cancer consortium around the country. This was presented at a big cancer conference called ASCO uh, a couple of months ago. And what we found is that unfortunately throughout lung cancer care, patients are not getting enough genetic testing. Um, for the most common mutations, things like EGFR, ALK, 
Um, we do fairly well, you know, about three quarters of the population is getting some form of testing. But if we look down at some of the less common markers, these, these are really dropping off. And we're, this slide says five biomarker tests. I want at least eight different biomarkers for my patients and probably more. Um, so this is kind of the core of what we need and we're not even doing the best with that. And what I always say is if this was my family member, if this was my loved one, that would not be good enough. I wanna make sure that I have this information so I can have the best care for my patients. And unfortunately, this is really a, 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 a big disparity issue is that patients of color, patients of lower socioeconomic backgrounds, do not have the same rate of testing as, as, other, as a Caucasian well-to-do population. Um, and again, that's just not good enough. That's not good enough for us. Uh, and particularly in some uh, groups of color, particularly at Asian Americans, there are a large number of EGFR mutations and other different uh, populations that have more prevalent mutations that we have to make sure that we're, we're checking for um, because it really does change how we care for these patients. Next slide. And it really matters because again, these treatments work. This is just one slide about a medication called selpercatinib for a, a very rare mutation called RET. It accounts for maybe a, a percentage or two points of all lung adenocarcinomas, but you can see on the left side, a patient with a very large bright tumor uh, in their breathing tube, a very large tumor below that in their lung field. And eight weeks later after starting this pill, it is virtually gone. These, these, you know, this is a very nice example, but this is not an exception. This is a very common thing on these targeted therapies to have these dramatic responses. Um, and, and it feels so satisfying as, as a caregiver to see my patients go from being very ill to being very well quickly. Next slide. Um, and most of the way that we've historically gotten this genetic information is by a tissue biopsy. We have you in, our interventionists either do a, a biopsy through your chest wall, we have them go down through your mouth and biopsy some of the lymph nodes or the mass through your airway. But even at really good academic universities and, and centers like uh, Mount Sinai, but also like UPenn, Northwestern University, Washington uh, University, that are, are, are also very good centers, they are, they are not able to get enough tissue for these genetic results, you know, 40 to 50% of the time. Next slide. So how can we, uh, yeah, you can scroll all the way to the end of this one, I think, hit, hit. And there, perfect. Oh, one back. Um, so uh, one way that I found that I can help uh, solve this problem is by liquid biopsies. So this is a really cool way, thing that I've been doing for a couple of years and is becoming really part of standard of care where we take a blood test because tumors, as I said, can generate their own blood supplies. So as the tumor grows, it asks blood cells, uh, blood vessels to come grow into it. And while that happens, they actually make pretty bad blood cells, uh, tumors. And uh, it leaks a lot of the information of that tumor into the bloodstream. So the DNA actually gets released into the bloodstream and we can pick that up. We can find things like point mutations and structural changes in these tumors that lead to me understanding these genetic mutations. So a lot of the times I can get the same information that I can get from a tissue biopsy in the liquid or in your blood. And it's also applicable to other uh, you know, quote, liquids in your body, pleural fluids, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, pretty much any liquid in your body may have some value uh, to assess your tumor depending on where it is. Next slide. And honestly, both are not perfect. Tissue is not perfect. Liquid is not perfect. About 10% of the time that you get a tissue biopsy, even if there is a genetic mutation there, you're going to miss it. And about 15% of the time, if you get a liquid biopsy that's negative, you might have missed something. So what we found is by doing both, we get better. Next slide. So this is some study actually out of UPenn. One of my, my colleagues and friends, Taro Agawal, who's a great uh, thoracic oncologist, did a study that they did tissue and liquid together up front for new diagnoses. And when they checked blood tests and tissue biopsies together, they almost doubled the amount of mutations they were able to find. And they also were able to understand that there's really good concordance between these, these tests, meaning that they both show the same stuff, that um, they are both reflecting what is going on in a, a patient's cancer. Next slide. And again, just two other uh, areas that just shows that both are better. That often you'll see these circles are overlapping, that it's gonna, you're gonna find these results in both the tissue test and the blood test, but sometimes you find it only in the tissue and sometimes you find it only in the blood. So doing both really makes a lot of sense to me. Next slide. 
this was uh, also shown that um, Natasha Leal, who's another great thoracic oncologist, uh, there's something called the Nile trial, where she actually did a blood test up front um, while she was getting her tissue testing. And it was found that actually, if you looked at the blood first, you found more genetic mutations, 87% versus 67%. And during the time of the study, which is now a couple of years old, the turnaround time on this blood test went from almost two weeks to about one week. In, in my clinical practice right now, I can often get blood pet tests back in one week pretty, pretty reliably. Um, so I am now doing both blood and tissue up front on almost all of my patients to try and find this information as soon as possible, but also to make sure I don't miss anything on either one of those tests. Next slide. Because not only is it helping me decide the right treatment, it's helping me avoid the wrong treatment. So um, here we see a couple of common mutations here, EGFR, ALK, BRAF, MET, um, and their response rates to targeted therapy, honestly, I would round these up. I think that at least three quarters of patients respond to targeted therapies. Um, but for immunotherapies, their response range is about 40 to 20% depending on the mutation. So these are patients I honestly don't often want to expose to immune therapies uh, as a first or second treatment. I'd much rather have them on a targeted therapy. Next slide. And then I think liquid biopsies honestly have a really promising future. Um, to help us monitor uh, early detecting of, of, uh, of cancers for screening. So we talked about scan screening, but what if we could pair this up with a blood test? Um, and honestly, the, the data is starting to form in this space that we may be able to screen for cancers with a blood test along with imaging. I can see throughout the treatment course with my patients, whether they're on a targeted therapy or whether they are on immune therapy, whether they had surgery, how they're doing in their treatments. You know, if I put them on a new therapy, are they responding to it? A blood test could help me understand that much sooner than a scan. If I gave them surgery or chemotherapy with radiation to together, if they had tumor in their blood, uh, tumor cells in their blood, and then afterwards they don't, that means we probably did a really good job and these patients may be cured and may not need more therapy. And also just to kind of understand how they're going along in their treatment. And, you know, if we put somebody on a targeted therapy, Sometimes these patients have what we call resistance mutations or, or changes in their tumor biology that make me need to change how I'm approaching their care. Um, so there's really exciting uh, ideas on, uh, on the horizon for us to help improve our cancer care. Next slide. So just really, really quickly, I think, you know, if we talk about it, we should show how we put it into practice. So um, this is a case that I just saw recently, a 50, 58 year old Chinese female, not a smoker, no family or medical, uh, medical history. She had cough, weight loss, night sweats. Again, very nonspecific presenting symptoms, but unfortunately was found to have this right upper lung mass. that was about five and a half centimeters, as well as lung nodules and large lymph nodes in the middle of her chest and liver lesions. So this was unfortunately a very concerning situation for, for the patient, but she didn't have a biopsy when she showed up at my door. Um, she had shortness of breath and it was really affecting her day-to-day -day function. Next slide. So while I was getting her baseline scans, coordinating her biopsy, I said, hey, let's get a blood test. Um, so while she was having her tissue test um, that confirmed my clinical diagnosis of lung cancer and her uh, genetics were being sent to the uh, lab, which can take up to two weeks to result, about two days after her biopsy, I already had the results of my liquid biopsy that showed something called an ALK fusion, which is actually a very treatable disease uh, with an oral pill um, and can control cancers for years and years. Um, so I was already able to put this patient on their therapy. And by the time the tissue test came back, that patient was already feeling better and having a really good quality of life. Uh, next slide. And you can see here, she had a dramatic response uh, in her primary tumor. It shrunk about 50% um, in a couple of months. Um, and this was honestly uh, only after really six or so weeks of therapy. Um, so she continues to do very well from that standpoint. Next slide. And just a couple of other things that I like to talk to my patients about. Of course, I do not want to highlight smoking in lung cancer. I think that there is a big stigma of smoking in lung cancer and up to 20% of lung cancers have no relation to smoking whatsoever. Um, and even those patients who are smokers, they may not have had a lung cancer because of their smoking. But of course, if they are smoking, I encourage them to stop. If they have stopped, I encourage them to continue because it can really help uh, prevent secondary cancers, complications from treatments. 
Um, and people just don't feel as well uh, when they are on, when they're smoking and getting cancer care. I encourage my patients to stay active, at least 30 minutes of activity most days of the week. What exactly that means for each of my patients is different. Um, eat healthy, particularly plant sources, try to limit alcohol consumption, maintain healthy weight. And of course, things like vaccinations, flu, herpes zoster, pneumococcal, and now COVID-19, of course, is very critical. Um, so I encourage all my patients to take care of all the rest of their health access while they're, while they're being cared for. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, so that was a very quick tour de force. I want to get on to Dr. Teets because I think he has some really exciting stuff to, to uh, uh, offer us today. But really, um, the, the bottom line is we have to do well for our patients, for our loved ones, make sure we get the right information and, and to minimize disparities, get patients all the same care. And I think one way to do that is liquid biopsies, but um, that's only one solution. We have to start from the grassroots, getting patients the right kind of screening, the right kind of care, surveillance and access to care, um, which is a whole different presentation, but, but something I, I, I am passionate about. So thank you guys for listening. Um, and I wish you a very fruitful and uh, impactful Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Rose. That was really, really informative. Um, I'd like to move along in the interest of time, but if anyone has any questions, you know, you can go ahead and type those in the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, but right now I'd like to introduce Dr. Raymond Teets. Um, Dr. Teets is a faculty and director of integrative medicine at the Mount Sinai Downtown Residency in Urban Family Medicine and assistant professor at the Eakin School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's a Bravewell Fellow and Associate Fellow at the University of Arizona Program in Integrative Medicine. Um, Dr. Teets is a Director of the Pilot Program of the Integrative Medicine in Residency and is working on a project to teach integrative medicine to third and fourth year medical students rotating through the Family Medicine Clerkship. He has an integrative medicine practice in the Institute for Family Health at 17th Street where he uses his electronic health record to aid in providing integrative medicine within an underserved location. He has a strong interest in nutrition, herbs and supplements, and mind-body medicine. And with a background in philosophy, Dr. Teets is also interested in how the medical paradigm can be rethought to improve mind-body medicine. Uh, for example, in situations where patients present with unexplained symptoms. In 2019, Dr. Teets was elected secretary to the board of directors of the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health. Um, so we're really pleased to have him and thank you so much for being with us today to uh, talk about integrative approaches. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate the intro and an honored to be here with my colleague, Dr. Rose. I think one of the things that's exciting to see too is, um, is just the highlight on his approach or his focus on looking at inequities um, around the biopsies, because that's really part of, you know, I'm, I'm an employee um, of the Institute for Family Health, and we obviously have a, a strong affiliation with Mount Sinai, but my employer specifically looks at trying to serve the underserved. So this is also a passion of ours. And part of, part of my interest in integrative medicine largely is to try to also have that accessible. Um, so just waiting for the slides to come up. There they are. Cool. So, um, so you can jump to the next slide. So what I wanted to offer first, there's, I, mean, I feel like it's kind of interesting in that the integrative medicine is one of these terms that has a lot of legs in the press. Um, having been involved with it and practiced since you know, the early 2000s, it's really sort of morphed. It's been interesting, you know, I've been practicing long enough to see all the changes that Dr. Rose identified that are really exciting. And then there's also been some parallel changes in my world. The, the idea of integrative medicine as I practice it and as it's generally understood in an academic context is this idea of really reaffirming the relationship between provider and patient, trying to take into account the whole picture um, and certainly informed by evidence and then trying to be broad and inclusive around, well, what really can we think about around lifestyle, around other therapies that maybe aren't typical for what we're assuming in the medical industry, but that's changing. And how can we really do that to not simply think about, you know, preventing disease, which is super important, but also thinking about how can we help people really achieve optimal health? Um, not easy to measure um, because in a sense it's very personal, but something that nonetheless is very important. Next slide. So my background with this goofy picture, uh, I partially put it because the bio I gave Gene is, I realize a little outdated, 
but but I am board certified in family medicine, integrative medicine. I did the fellowship as mentioned. And then currently we have, we do have an integrative family medicine fellowship that I direct and we have our residency integrative curriculum. Um, and then currently it's been exciting. We are participating with three other sites on the West Coast, looking at an acupuncture study um, for 65 and up patients, essentially Medicare recipients, looking to see how can we pragmatically use acupuncture for that group of folks with chronic lower back pain. Um, I am told that CMS or Medicare is paying attention, although I learned that at the federal level, how well NIH and CMS talks is a matter of, you know, politics. So, and then as mentioned, I'm on the board of Academic Consortium of Integrated Medicine and Health. Next slide. Um, so I see my role as really being supportive. I mean, it's, it's you know, listening to Dr. Rose, this is where, as a specialist, he's getting in there, finding the evidence that's really, I mean, this is life-changing stuff, all puns intended. And so I see my role on being, well, how can I help coordinate that? How can I help think about some of the things that are broader? Obviously, there are people with lung cancer who have diabetes or they have hypertension. Those things still need to be paid attention to. From the integrative perspective, Again, to sort of make concrete that very, you know, abstract definition that I showed you. Well, how can I help patients feel empowered? How can I um, get to where they are and understand what they need, what they want, so that we can talk about nutrition appropriately, movement or exercise, stress management, the occasional dietary supplement, and I'll talk about that in a sec. And then really using the referrals to my integrative colleagues in acupuncture, uh, osteopath, chiropractor, mind-body practitioners, etc. There's a whole wealth of folks in the community, as you can imagine, um, many of them within a licensure structure, some of them not. And that's where I see my role as being, you know, essentially the broker of how do I help people find the right people. Um, and, and just to put this in context, I don't know how familiar people are with family medicine. That's somewhat of a rare animal in the New York City area. But basically, you know, we take care of, you know, kids and adults. So I have I do have, you know, a few day old, although they're older now, patients, and then I do have folks who are nearing the end of their lives. So um, it, in that sense, just so you're aware, but a primary care. Uh, next slide. The complementary and integrative health modalities is just more language. Again, these are things that have changed over the decade or so that this has all been here. And it's just a way to umbrella capture who are my colleagues in the integrative world, who are our colleagues in the integrative world, so Chinese medicine is one example. Usually they're you know, labeled, if you will, as acupuncturists, although all of them do receive training on other things like herbs and moxibustion and the like. There's a very good school, the Pacific College of Health Sciences that we have a close relationship with and their students come to our site um, that's down in Wall Street. And then it's also fair to understand, I know in the Sinai system too, we have what are called, and, and in my home institution, we have what are called certified acupuncturists. So those are medical providers, often MDs or DOs, physicians, who have done 300 hours of training and they can practice acupuncture too. And so they do also represent another point of access to get people to, to these modalities. Um, then you can see, I mean, these probably are familiar, right? Chiropractors, and I've already mentioned some of them, healing touch, therapeutic massage, meditation, yoga, integrative nutrition. And I think what's, what becomes sort of my job is to be mindful about the fact, all puns intended, that these aren't always accessible, that you know, acupuncture has some coverage in insurance, but it's pretty limited. And also even when insurance covers, it's limited in what they'll cover, right? Um, so being judicious about that, trying to be imaginative, but well, here's some low cost options. So that's really how I see my role is certainly if I can identify the best for a patient, in terms of referrals, great, but I'm also trying to just be cognizant of access and cost. The wellness approach is another, I think, term that's been bandied about in the media, et cetera, um, and I think is worth unpacking. And the reason I bring it up is it's, so there's, there's always sort of two lenses that I'm trying to think about in my office. One is the, the disease management, where Dr. Rose has outlined very clearly a lot of the disease management that needs to happen. How do we really pay attention to what type of lung cancer we have going on? So, and I need to think about that too, if we're talking about hypertension or diabetes or even lung cancer, particularly early on, right? Um, but then there's a wellness approach. And this is the idea that we really wanna ask some important questions about what's important to the patient. Where, what, um, earlier, Nicholas, Dr. Rose, forgive me, talked about one of his Asian patients not being able to get around in terms of fatigue and that kind of thing. So that's gonna be one of my questions. So what's the barrier 
that this lung cancer provides? What can't you do that I should know about in case that's helpful? Well, you know, as an example, I love to do yoga, but I just don't have the motivation or the energy right now. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Is that a is that a problem of struggling with understandable depression? Is that actually a chronic a, a sort of a pain problem? What are the ways in which I can help through thinking about still these different modalities, thinking about nutrition, thinking about support? Next slide. And I just want to say out loud, I think the reality is, and I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but with cancer or any illness, but certainly with cancer, we know that these modalities are being used by patients, whether or not they tell their physicians. We know that supplements are used, whether or not they declare them. Because I think we've probably all patients have had the experience that sometimes a physician is not open to it or they, they're worried they're not open to it, right? So I just want to validate that, that happens. Um, and it is a different sort of process than pharmaceuticals, medicines, chemotherapeutic, et cetera. But nonetheless, the discussion ideally should occur. Next slide. The different stages that obviously I'm running through quickly is thinking about prevention, uh, certainly treatment, which I think is most uh, probably on folks' minds right now, and then what's called survivorship. And I think this term you know, has really been popularized in an important way by breast cancer survivors. Um, prevention and survivorship as I go forward, we can sort of put together because there's a lot of similarities. Um, and so as I, I will do that as we talk, the treatment, we can talk about next. So next slide. Okay. So the treatment phase, it depends on the cancer, you know, in the same way that the lung cancers now are really getting understood as being different, even within that general rubric. I um, mean, so different than certainly when I trained. Um, in, in, uh, again, that you want to know sort of which specific cancer we're dealing with as an integrative provider, but there are some general approaches. You know, the first he already made reference to Dr. Rose did is around thinking about um, immune support. Um, and so what are the things that we know generally has a salutary or a beneficial effect for the immune system? That's good sleep, good nutrition, some movement, community support. I mean, I think the pandemic really illustrated for us that, hey, it turns out that human beings need each other. Um, and we knew that, right? But this really brought it home. And so um, being, being cognizant of that, I think is, is helpful for me. Um, mind-body strategies, meditation, prayer, and yoga. If if folks say, "Look, I get a lot of you know um, stress relief out of going to temple and church," you know, I'm concerned about how to do that safely. Then that's a great uh, time for me to have a conversation. Well, yeah. So what does safely mean when we're talking about coming, hopefully coming out of a pandemic, but you have chronic illness or you have the lung cancer to struggle with? The other way in which integrative medicine can be helpful is mitigating side effects. Um, acupuncture, one of the best studied really of the modalities has a, a significant amount of evidence looking at um, its use in nausea induced, or sorry, chemotherapy that causes nausea, um, which still can happen from time to time. So that's one role, for instance, where what I have listed is a high touch therapy. Um, it's safe and it can be used. Therapeutic massage is another healing touch a third, in fact, we did have a program in Chelsea with Diane Sarah, I think she's since retired, but she was doing a healing touch where she would work with patients in the throes of their, their cancer work. Um, very judicious use of dietary supplements. This is probably the piece where it's just really important to declare this to your medical providers because there are the stakes are high and there's, there's concerns about interactions. St. John's Ward is a great one, which you may have heard of. It's a, an herbal preparation that's available. It's safe by its, does have decent evidence for treatment of depression, but it also affects metabolism. And so it can really affect how the body, you know, um, it metabolizes um, chemotherapeutic agents or pharmaceuticals in general. So that's one example. Next slide. The other more general piece is that because we know that with some chemotherapeutic agents, because of, of radiation therapy, um, there's an antioxidant effect. And a lot of supplements bring in their own antioxidant or reductive effect in high, because they're higher dose. And so again, there's this real concern that there really could be some important interactions. And so generally, I, you know, I would say, look, in, in the throes of the lung cancer treatment, I think it's best to really take a step back away from the supplements, unless there's a really good conversation and dialogue between the oncologist, the integrative practitioner, et cetera, because the stakes are high here. And, and we're also typically talking about a discrete period of time. 
and there's still other things that can be done. Next slide. So if we think more concretely about a lung cancer integrative approach where my role is to be supportive as Dr. Rose does his role as, the, as a very focused disease treatment. So these, all these, we have five different things I've identified here, have inconsistent evidence, but it's generally positive. And also I think importantly, low harm to try, right? These are lifestyle measures or um, uh, mind body or body work stuff, high touch stuff that can be really helpful for folks. One of the things, and I'll expand on this later, is this is a healthy diet low in animal meat. There's some associated data that suggests that less animal meat translates into less cancer, lung cancer risk. Um, we know that mind-body modalities, whether we're talking about yoga, yoga, meditation, et cetera, can be helpful for quality of life, the chemotherapy-related nausea and symptoms. We know that acupuncture can be helpful. Um, therapeutic massage can be helpful for anxiety, and then yoga as important for quality of life. Next slide. Um, some beneficial foods that are specific to lung cancer, um, obviously the picture of the pomegranate. One of the ways to understand foods, obviously, is to understand the molecules that are inherent in them, what's the science. So carotenoids, which are you know vitamin A relatives, essentially, that tend to give vegetables their orange color, and you can see they're all orange except spinach. Um, selenium is a micronutrient, micromineral, it's still important. You can see those there. Quercetin um, is another uh, molecule that's important. And, and I feel comfortable with these because we don't worry about this quote unquote antioxidant effect in the throes of, of actual treatment. You know, I think they come with protection as well. And then you can see green tea, soy, garlic, etc. Next slide. Survivorship um, is you know obviously the biggest thing that I, I my father is recovering from or has is a survivor of. Uh, lymphoma, for instance, is so part of the conversation is always, so how is the five-year look? How are we at 10 years? You know, how did the PET scan go? And that's obviously super important. I think what we've recognized too is, well, what else can we do? How can we think about if there's any, you know, late effects of treatment? Uh, you know, sometimes there'll be some peripheral neuropathies that can be stubborn after chemotherapy. How do we improve quality of life in general? And how do we think about prolonging life for that matter? There may be lifestyle choices that though didn't have a direct impact on lung cancer that we're aware of, nonetheless, we can think about. And the philosophy here is addressing the fear, addressing the understandable sort of vigilance that can also bring fear. And yet again, looking for empowerment. What are the things that we can do safely together? Next slide. And so return to wellness, which I, you know, is a play on words, return to the concept of wellness, but for, for a lot of people also a return to wellness after they've been through, you know, the cancer fight. Because I, I imagine that a lot of times people will feel that way, right? They're a little imbalanced, by the news and then they're imbalanced by the therapies and they have to do it. So then how do we sort of get back balanced as best as we can? And that's again, thinking about these five pillars of health, nutrition, exercise, sleep and mental health, social support and stress management and all the ways in which I've already talked about, we can work on that together. Next slide. And then this is just to unpack one of the more, I think common ways to impact health, um, obviously is food. And so this is what's called the anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and, and what I like about it is a couple of things. Number one, um, in addition to it believed to be uh, helpful for, you know, in the, being supportive around cancer care, it also is a helpful diet for diabetes. It also is helpful for hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, the, the preeminent example people have heard of in the press, I think, is the Mediterranean diet. But if you look at this pyramid, which I borrowed from Dr. Weil's website, you can see actually it's talking a little bit more about um, an Asian diet. And, that's, and I intentionally use that to just say that an anti-inflammatory diet certainly does not have to be embedded in any one culture. And there's choices that could be made within all the different culinary traditions that still can be healthy. But you can see what's not at the bottom in contrast to what a traditional food pyramid is. If you've seen those, what's not at the bottom is carbs. That's what had traditionally been in the bottom. And instead they're de-emphasizing those a little and really focusing more on fruits and vegetables. Um, and then you can see meat occupies more of a middle tier. Um, here it's fish and shellfish. Um, it could be, you know, it could be red meat, but it, just less of it. Um, other things that are part of an anti-inflammatory diet, and then I know we need to finish up is, you know, the good fats, the omega-3 fatty acids that are less present in a typical American's diet, um, oleic acid from olive oil, the priority on plant-based foods, fiber. That's another thing that we, I think we all recognize we don't get enough of. And then limiting the processed foods, sugars, fats, 
certainly the trans fats bring those all together. Next slide. And then this finishes us out. I just wanted to offer, and I imagine there's a way we can disseminate those as people like them. Um, you know, the academic consortium is, is the academic consortium for integrative medicine that Mount Sinai is a member of. Um, and I think just offers, you know, a, a general sense of how this can fit into academia. Um, the VA I put up, I have a colleague who's managing, who's director of this program, where it's, it's essentially a very focused wellness program for veterans, where, uh, you know, what I've learned from it is asking the questions I've talked to you. What's important to the veteran now that he or she is struggling with PTSD or chronic pain? Our website, Mount Sinai Integrative Medicine, and then the last is the University of Arizona's Integrative Medicine website, which has resources as well. So and those are just a few of the links that I think can be helpful. And so that that wraps me up. Thank you so much, Dr. Teets. That was really, really pleasure. helpful. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, we should have a few minutes at the end. You can feel free to type them in. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to close us out with a brief discussion of meditation and mindfulness and uh, a brief exercise um, to end the day. Uh, so if you don't mind, Eduardo pulled it, pulling up that last slideshow. Great, you can go to the next one. And the next one, okay, great. So um, meditation is a wellness practice that when used along with standard medical treatment can help oncology patients address some cancer and treatment related symptoms. It's been shown to um, produce high blood, pre blood pressure, hot flashes, sleep and mood disturbances, stress and muscle and joint pain. Uh, it can also primarily help to lessen anxiety and stress when undergoing treatment, um, which is really uh, a great level for of extra support for patients uh, to kind of manage those, those emotions when um, you're going through this, this very stressful time. You can go to the next slide. So there are many, many different types of uh, meditation and mindfulness uh, techniques that can help people achieve these benefits. Um, so, you know, I'm sure many of you have your own experience with this, um, and I just want to highlight some of the the key points uh, that kind of unify this, this type of practice. So you wanna find a space that's calming and peaceful where you can focus without distractions. Um, meditations can be about maintaining focus on a specific posture or movement or on a specific uh, word or object or on your breathing. But the most important thing to remember when engaging in meditation is to have an open attitude. You know, you want to notice the thoughts and feelings that are coming up for you um, and kind of let them pass without judgment. And it's really a, a practice of being at peace uh, with yourself and, and where you're at. Um, so if, if everyone's open to it, I, I would like to close us out with a brief um, progressive muscle relaxation exercise. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and I also wanna highlight here that meditation is available uh, through uh, Mount Sinai Cancer Support Services every Monday and Wednesday with Alex, Alice Fox from 11 to 12. Um, so if you know, you're interested in getting more involved with meditation and mindfulness, that's certainly available. The information is there. It's also obviously found on our um, CSS calendar. Um, so it's a, it's a really great opportunity for uh, uh, our patients to take some time in their busy day to just kind of recenter and uh, get in touch with this. Um, so we'll do a brief exercise right now, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, but again, if, if you would like to learn more, you can certainly join Alice on, on Mondays and Wednesdays. So to prepare for this exercise, I'd like for you to uh, get as comfortable as you can. You can turn your camera off if you prefer. Uh, you can close your eyes or keep them open. Uh, and just begin by feeling the chair beneath you, the floor at your feet. Become aware of the feelings in your body at this moment. Uh, notice whether you're warm or cold and notice any other sensations that are coming up for you. We're going to relax each part of your body progressively. So you can start by focusing your attention on your hands, tune into them uh, and pay attention to the feelings in your hands. Begin to let go of the muscles, allowing them to become looser and heavier, letting go further 
more deeply and begin to feel that sensation coming into your forearms. Let your go of your muscles and concentrate on the relaxation without any tension and allowing that feeling to spread throughout your body. Now you can begin to let go in your upper arms. Notice your right and left arm getting heavier, more relaxed. Think about letting go of your muscles and notice how you were able to make them more relaxed and looser than how they are now. Anywhere you feel the tension, let that go. And notice how you were able to simply relax your body by thinking about it. Now let go in your shoulders. Notice each one getting heavier and imagine the muscles becoming smooth and relaxed. Finally, we're gonna bring attention to your forehead. Let go of your, the muscles in your forehead. Imagine it becoming smoother. Let that sensation spread to the muscles around your eyes and feel the tension release from your head. Notice feeling of heaviness, relaxation. Allow this to spread throughout the rest of your body. Continue to let go of all of your muscles and enjoy the feelings that accompany this deep sensation of relaxation. Let go of any tension and focus on the feeling of relaxation that surrounds you. You can take a few calming breaths. Slowly return to the present moment. Notice what those what this exercise brought up for you, how your body's feeling, and what thoughts are arriving for you. Let them come and go without judgment and come back to the present moment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone uh, participating in that. Um, I also obviously wanna thank Dr. Rose and Dr. Keats again for uh, they're very informative and helpful presentations. Um, again, we have a few minutes left. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to type them in the chat or take yourself off mute to ask directly. I see we have a hand from, from Mike. If you want to take yourself off mute, you can go ahead and ask. Um, thank you, Jean. Um, sure. That was an awesome job um, with the meditation. I had fun in just five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, more importantly, it's amazing how you're able to pack so much into just one hour. Thank you. Uh, my two quick questions. First, I hope we're going to get a food uh, pyramid uh, from Dr. Tietz. That particular slide on the pyramid itself, on the food pyramid. And then the second question is uh, for the first presentation. I wanted to know if a sarcoma with metastasis to the lungs will still uh, be treated as a lung cancer. Um, so yeah, I would love to see that food pyramid as well. And uh, Gene, that's not fair because I'm already I'm like half asleep right now in the middle of my day. So it's super relaxing. I'll bring um, you a coffee later. <laughs> fantastic. Um, uh, really good question, Mike. So you know, I, I, the the thing is that when a cancer moves from where it started to somewhere else in the body, we call that a metastasis, and it's the same cancer. So you know, if lung cancer moves to the bone, it's not a bone cancer; it's lung cancer in the bone. So. I have been sent sarcoma patients who have lung masses, and I say, this is a sarcoma, they should see a sarcoma specialist, not me. Um, but sarcomas, while they were very frustrating tumors to begin with, are also joining in this targeted revolution and have a lot of genetic uh, changes that are really important for us to look at. So um, if you have, if you, if yourself or a loved one has a sarcoma, I would make sure that they have a comprehensive genetic evaluation to make sure that they have opportunities either for approved targeted therapies or some promising clinical trials. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we will be able to send out uh, some of the information we've uh, shared today. And I'll definitely connect with Dr. Teets to see what we can uh, disseminate to those of you who registered. Well, we're almost at time. So if there are no additional questions, um, I again wanna extend a thank you to everyone for joining us and, and my gratitude 
to Dr. Teets and Dr. Rose for offering up their time and expertise on this really important topic. Um, and thank you all so much. I hope you all have a great uh, rest of November and holiday holiday season. Take care. Great job. Happy, happy holidays, yeah. everybody. Take care. Happy Be well. Happy holidays. Take care. Bye.